So with those housekeeping details attended to, I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires uh, this work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and I'm delighted to see so many groups of you in the audience today. That's really fantastic. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. So I am thrilled to welcome our presenters today. Jackie Dooley from OCLC recently retired, but who thankfully agreed to participate in this webinar. Rebecca Gunther, Metadata Standards Consultant, Claudia Horning from University of California, Los Angeles, and Mary Simoleon from the Harvard Business School. And so with that, I am going to turn things over to Jackie to kick things off. Jackie, you have controls. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Marilee, and hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, um, whoops. Uh, come on, slide advance. Okay. Um, I'll be offering an overview of WAM's work in general uh, through this working group and of the 14 data elements that are recommended in our report. All four of today's speakers are members of WAM and contrib contributed substantially to the work, so we're all pretty well versed in the process we used, the preparatory research we did, and the content of the recommendations. So why did we do this work? About two and a half years ago, the OCLC Research Library Partnership Program Officers who specialized in archives and special collections investigated whether partners would be interested in working with us on a web archive issue, and metadata emerged as the top shared priority. We were elated at the enthusiastic response for volunteers, as well as the varying expertise and experience that they represented in the aggregates, and today's speakers reflect that variety very well. And then we soon discovered that a survey of users of web archives had had the same outcome. That was a bit of a surprise, at least to me, but a welcome one. Websites don't easily conform to any of our existing library or archival standards, so the survey results confirmed our sense that guidance was needed to help practitioners apply their chosen standards in the web context. Our core objective was to guide those who describe websites toward consistent application of their own standards, if any, in the web context. Our preparatory research showed very little consistency across or even within institutions. There is nothing revolutionary about the 14 elements we chose, which you'll see in a moment, but the definition, guidance on devising the content of each element, examples, and crosswalks all contribute toward consistent description of archived web content. We didn't come up with our recommendations overnight or out of thin air. We worked for a year doing preparatory research before starting to write our three reports. It was, of course, important to understand the relevant standards land landscape to see the context in which archived web content was addressed. Perhaps even more important, however, was our work to review institution-specific guidelines and extant records both of which confirmed an utter lack of consistent application of standards, as I mentioned earlier. Also, extensive reading on user needs was key to our decisions about recommended elements. For example, these two clear pieces of intelligence emerged. Users want to understand the provenance of the metadata, and they want clarity in reading the content of a metadata record, and there's nothing new in that one. We had in mind a wide array of potential users of our recommendations as listed here. We expect that those using detailed library and archival standards will map the 14 WAM elements to RDA and MARC in libraries, DAX and EAD in archives. One example, archivists use an extensive set of very specific elements to describe things such as creator, provenance, restrictions to access and use, and the person who processed the collection all of which would map to the WAM description element. That's similar, that's the same as Dublin Core in that respect. Our, intent, our intentionally lean element set maps fairly readily to basic Dublin Core, which is by far the most widely used standard across the archival, web, archived web metadata community. In large part, that's in large part because about 80% of those responding to a respected biennial survey of web archiving institutions use Archivit. If you're not familiar with it, Archivit is a turnkey system developed by the Internet Archive, 
for harvesting, describing, and providing access to archived web content. Its data element set is taken straight from Dublin Core, but the user documentation is very, <coughs> excuse me, very thin on guidance for devising the content of each element. It's worth noting, by the way, that a uh, bit of a sidebar, the archive structure assumes that harvested sites are in some way grouped as collections. And I think that's pretty standard across the community, whether or not people are using Archivit. Both collection level and item level descriptions are made and are inherently linked to each other in the same fashion as one sees in a typical archival finding aid. Item descriptions often consist of only the title of the site at the time of harvesting and a link to the access URL. And those very brief item descriptions are, as you can imagine, um, due to the fact that resources, human resources are very limited for creating this metadata. Another category, institutions that have a dams for managing digital content also tend to provide lean description, often based in Dublin Core. Finally, we learned that many scholars who use web content in their research build their own collections of archived content often because they don't realize that libraries and archives are doing this work, but also the likelihood that an institution has archived the specific sites that that researcher need is, in fact, low. Uh, also, these researchers have little or, or no knowledge about how to devise standard metadata. In this context, they're an important potential user group for WAM's recommendations. So here's our recommended element set. I'll give you a moment to take a look at that. And on the next slide, I'll show you the criteria we use to select them. You can see that some are absolutely basic in almost any library or archived metadata content. Creator, contributor, 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 date, extent, genre form, et cetera. While others such as collector, description, and rights are less common. So the criteria we used, keep it lean so as to be adaptable by an array of communities, adaptable and mappable, include elements used for basic description of just about any type of resource, stick to those that have clear applicability to archived web content, and exclude those that don't clearly apply. I'll now go through three of those 14 elements to give you a sense of what WAM's data dictionary looks like. Each element has a name, definition, usage notes, examples, and a crosswalk to five data structure standards. The explanation of the title element, which isn't in, um, doesn't appear on this slide, makes it clear that descriptions can be at either the individual site level or for a collection. Usage notes and examples are given for both. So here's the definition and several examples for single sites. You can see how strange some titles are. And then the part of the description plus some examples for collections of archived sites. And the crosswalks. The crosswalk from Mark 21, you see a clear example of that um, mapping to the more detailed standard. Next up is source of description. We were well along in our research before we realized its importance given users' desire for provenance information. Few institutions have the resources to describe individual sites at scale in the first place, let alone review those previously described to see whether they've changed. When looking at the set of archived instances of a collection that have been harvested, one sees that the identifying elements of some sites have changed so significantly that it's barely recognizable as the same site. As these examples show, the content of this element consists chiefly of the date of harvest and the title of the site at that time. So because websites can change so regularly, so constantly, and become so different, knowing uh, when, which, which version was used for the description is, in fact, extremely important. And the crosswalk. My third example is collector, defined as the institution responsible for having archived the content and for managing the metadata and archived content. More often than not, the institution also stores the digital content locally, but not necessarily. Archive, archivit users are a good example of that. Archivit stores their content. In general, collector doesn't map 
cleanly to the other standards, so we included this list of relevant activities performed by the collector. And this element is both named and crosswalked differently across the landscape of guidelines and extant records that we used. Uh, whole, um, gosh, what are some of the repository is one that's really frequent. These examples uh, serve to differentiate the creator of the content from the collector. That's a point of inconsistency we saw in a lot of records, um, such as the harvesting institution being tagged as the creator of the web element. Um, let's dissect that third example, the archiblog, for a moment. So the creator is this organization, Association for Research into Crimes Against Art, and this is their blog, archiblog. The collector, however, is not that association, but the New York Art Research, Research, Resources Consortium, um, which is a group of three New York City museums that have a fantastic um, web archiving program. Uh, Rebecca will mention that briefly in a minute. And then here's the crosswalk. Okay, that's it. I'll turn it over to Rebecca Gunther, who will put WAMS recommendations in the broader context of exi existing standards and practices. And it'll come as no surprise to many of you that her incredible expertise across the standards landscape was indispensable to our work. Thanks. Thank you, Jackie. Um, any initiative that aims to provide descriptions of web archives needs to consider issues of scalability and how much is being collected. This affects the resources that are devoted to it and whether the institution will have to rely on metadata within the archive sites and the tools to extract it. It also affects the level of cataloging that can be applied, collection level or seed level. For instance, an institution such as the British Library, whose responsibility it is to collect the entire UK domain, can't possibly provide description of individual sites. Do archive websites fit rules of archival or bibliographic description or both? This largely depends on the purpose of collecting them. For instance, is it a theme-based collection? Is it to archive material no longer being made available in a printed format because and the websites are valuable for research purposes? Is it for collecting one's own individual websites like other archival records? And then there's the question of what level you should describe them at, collection level or individual sites. These decisions are often made depending on the part of the organization that's responsible for web archiving. If the archives are given that responsibility, they're often described archivally, while if the library is archiving the re is responsible for archiving the resources um, and they're, they're doing it to um, uh, keep valuable those that they consider valuable, then they might be described bibliographically. Considering thematic collections, do these collections fit the concepts of archival description where context and provenance are important? Since they are, they are collections of material with their most common attribute being the subject matter, or do they better fit bibliographic description? And then, how far do you go in cataloging individual sites? Do you catalog just the collection or also individual pages? We aren't really sure what to call some of the, these new concepts and responsibilities. There are differences in vocabulary between the bibliographic and the archival approach, and Jackie pointed out some of these in her opening remarks. And what do we even call these resources? Website with a space versus website without a space versus web archive. Uh, there, are, there, hasn't, there isn't a commonly used term, although all of these have been used. Do we call these those responsible collectors or repositories? What do we do? Are they collectors or repositories? That's one of the things Jackie point out, pointed out. Different words are used in different communities. And what are their roles? If the institution is archiving to support research, what does it mean to hold the item? If the collections are physically archived in Internet Archive, what kinds of responsibility do these institutions have? 
Other factors that affect how they're described includes how the web archives will be discovered and used, which depends on largely on why we're choosing to archive them. Will we rely on archive it and the Dublin Core metadata it uses for discovery? Will the descriptions be integrated into a library catalog or part of a finding aid? Will we use a discovery platform that integrates different kinds of descriptions from different sources? The task of developing general description guidelines that are neutral in terms of metadata standards is a difficult one given the variety of environments and practices we've seen. For any metadata standardization, there's always a conflict between flexibility and specificity. The more flexible and loose the guidelines are, the more likely that the implementer will need additional guidelines, perhaps in the form of an application profile. The more specific it is, the less likely it can be used generally by multiple kinds of applications. There are also issues with how the description process fits into established workflows in each institution. No one wants a completely different process for describing websites. It's most efficient in terms of training, record creation, and searching to integrate it with existing workflows. We're trying to fit the description of websites into our traditional standards for content rules and data structure standards. But those standards aren't well adapted to born digital material. How do we apply them to the relationship between the live site and the archive site? What some choose to describe both. Because of limited cataloging resources, we may not want to create and maintain separate records for them, and not all institutions have decided to um, rely on Google to find the live site. How do they fit into our categories for things like issuance, what we call in Mark bibliographic level, that is uh, the categories of serial versus integrating versus collection versus monograph? How will they be integrated with other descriptions? It seems that there are many different choices that have been made by institutions creating metadata descriptions for web archives. Dub, uh, the use of Dublin Core in Archivit, the use of MARCs in um, institutions like Columbia and the New York Art Resources Consortium, uh, MODS uh, that, that the Library of Congress uses, used, and um, EAD. Uh, that archival collections have used. And now we can hear about some of these choices. I'll turn it over to Claudia Horning from UCLA to talk about their experience describing archived websites in MARC. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. That was a great lead-in for my slides on how we've been handling archived uh, metadata for archived websites at UCLA, both historically and starting to look forward using the WAM guidelines. So the UCLA Library Cataloging and Metadata Center has been cataloging live online websites and integrating resources for quite a while, uh, following first, of course, AACR2, and now RDA as our content standard. And generally speaking, we create MARC records in OCLC WorldCat, which we load into our ILS for discovery in our online catalog. Uh, this slide shows you the main standards and guidelines we look to when we're creating our descriptive metadata. Um, so another, another way of stating this is that we have treated um, description of online resources as much as we do the print and other resources the library selects and acquires with item level bibliographic description as the default description. So our first experience describing archived web content was in connection with our California campaign literature archive, which consists of materials broadly related to state and local elections. Our tangible campaign literature collection contains materials dating back to 1908, um, and we first began archiving websites or campaign literature websites at the end of the 1990s, at first locally in our digital library program, and then using a tool that the California Digital Library developed called the Web Archiving Service, or WAS, and then currently we've transitioned to using Archive-It. Uh, initially, these resources were discoverable only through our digital library portal, and then later through the WAS portal, and then finally through the Archive It portal. Uh, the selector who was archiving the campaign literature websites was concerned that uh, users were not finding them. So in uh, 2013, we worked with her to conduct a very small pilot project to see if we could use the minimal Dublin Core metadata she was entering in 
was, which was basically title, tags, and a descriptive note. Um, and then the information that was was capturing about crawl dates to create mark records. And so in other words, we, try to, we decided to try to improve discoverability by treating them like we treat other resources in our traditional cataloging environment by creating title or page level sort of bibliographic descriptions that would be loaded into our catalog. So since so many sites um, were being archived, we really wanted to see if the process could be automated in whole or in part. We had some concerns in common in meeting with the selector um, that we wanted to try to address in these descriptions. Um, campaign websites, like many of the websites people are archiving, are notoriously ephemeral things. Uh, she was concerned that users might see a, something, a description of a website that was related to, say, a proposition, and not even bother clicking on a link because they would just assume the site was dead. So we, she wanted to make sure they knew it was archived for that reason. And on the other side, we also wanted to make sure that users knew they weren't retrieving live websites because we didn't want to mislead them. So we came up with the following uh, four ways to identify within the MARC records that these were archived websites, which possibly was overkill. Uh, that experience is, oh, and I should say, we did successfully create these MARC records, but the process did end up being uh, more hands-on than we had hoped, so we set it aside for a while to see if we could come up with a, a better strategy. Uh, that experience is one of the reasons I just was excited to join, to join the WAM working group, and these are some of the others. It was a great opportunity to learn from colleagues at other institutions all over the place and to collaborate on the development of best practices and standards, again, all with the goal of promoting discovery and use of these resources. So today at the UCLA Library, we are continuing to capture uh, individual pages and collections of pages uh, for some of the existing collections like our campaign literature archive and some others, we are slowly as traditional catalogers coming to terms with the idea, idea that we simply don't have the resources to describe all of them at the item or the site level. And this parallels a similar discussion we have um, with stakeholders in our digital library program as we continue to digitize the library's unique archival collections. As part of our international digital ephemera project, um, we are archiving more thematic collections of websites especially resources we think are at risk of disappearing. Uh, the resources are identified by UCLA library subject experts in collaboration with our international partners. We do some of the archiving and they do some of the archiving themselves. Uh, we're in see increasingly seeking to capture things like videos and other embedded content on web pages. Often these are if, at least as, if not more significant than the web page hosting it. So for example, think of things like uh, videos that were streamed on an individual or group Facebook page. Uh, this particular one is uh, from a collection of sites about the Kurdish independence referendum in Iraq. So looking forward, we just started to discuss the WAM guide recommendations and have not yet developed UCLA specific best practices. We foresee um, some challenges looking forward. So as I've already said, our catalogers tend to default to title level or item level bibliographic descriptions, but we have already been in the practice of providing collection level description for some categories of even tangible materials when we lacked either the resources or the expertise to catalog items individually. So I expect catalogers here will take this collection level approach in stride. Uh, for now, we're making these um, level of description decisions on a case-by-case -case basis, but looking forward, we'll probably consider com creating some sort of general principles to help guide us. Uh, catalogers here are generally unfamiliar with things that are a little bit more archival description processes, like uh, recording information related to provenance and appraisal. Um, outside of our special collections catalogers, we don't generally provide public information about you know, where our books come from or why we purchase them. So this will take a little bit of training and good communication with the librarians who are doing the selecting and archiving. Um, and similarly, outside of our special collections unit, few of our catalogers have experience with providing descriptive information about restrictions on access, use, and reuse of items. And we do expect to be able to address all of these challenges through training and documentation. So as we work on implementing the WAM recommendations locally, um, as in everything, communication with other library units is going to be key. Um, in talking with uh, selectors, 
we need to figure out how best to communicate their rationale for collecting specific archived websites or collections of websites, uh, making decisions with them on the level of description, uh, communicating um, information about the frequency of capture, information about maybe what is not being captured, um, and of course making sure that they're describing sites consistently so that we can build on any metadata they're creating. Uh, we'll also need to work with our scholarly communications unit to develop clear statements on legal rights and restrictions on use and guidance on how to use those. Um, the UCLA Library has an advisory committee on cataloging and metadata, which would be the, the body that would develop and document our recommended practices and guidelines. Uh, of course, we'll need to update workflows so that uh, we uh, learn of archived websites and, and can describe them appropriately. And finally, um, at some point, we will want to work with our library's assessment team to look at metrics for the use of this content and to look for ways to provide uh, better discoverability for our users. So you can find uh, most of our archived web content in Archive It at this link at the top of, this, of the slide. Um, if you're interested, I've also included links where you can view the catalog records from our campaign literature pilot project, as well as the single record for a collection of websites that was created by a cataloger uh, using the WAM guidelines. And just anecdotally, I can say that he reported that he found them very helpful. And now I am going to hand things off to Mary to talk about what they're doing at the Harvard Business School. Great. Um, thanks, Claudia. So um, at Harvard Business School, um, we build and curate preeminent collections of business practice and management theory, ensuring that the collections are accessible and preserved to the highest standard, regardless of format. Um, but we also serve as the trusted um, authority of the school's history. So to that end, we primarily collect web content created by Harvard Business School, which we consider to be the official records of the school. We also collect um, web content associated with speci specific contemporary business collections in our holdings, and that would be like Polaroid Corporation and Genzyme. Um, and in more recently, in 2017, we began collecting web content thematic in nature. So, for example, the American Manufacturing Council, um, which was part of the Trump administration, as many of our HBS alumni served on the council. And we are also collecting news articles related to one of our donating organizations. We have one staff member who is a lead for web archiving meaning that this is just part of his job. It's about 25% of his time, and he is responsible for scoping and setting up the crawls, performing post-crawl QAing, and creating metadata for all the collections. And as you see from this slide, here are just some stats um, about our program. It was launched in 2013, and we have been using Archivet um, as our web archiving service since its inception. So our current descriptive practices, um, it shouldn't come as a big surprise that we've taken archival, uh, an archival approach to descriptive metadata because we are a special collections repository and we primarily describe our content using archival descriptive practices. We create our um, Dublin Core descriptive metadata through Archivet at the collection level. Um, there is one collection that is not um, yet publicly available where we are describing the content at the seed level for our donor agreement, um, but currently this is a very manual process and is not sustainable for other collections at the time. We add an archival object in archive space um, at the in the resource record uh, where the archive web content belongs intellectually. And again, that is at the collection level. I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. And we provide very, very basic description of extent and location in um, the catalog record for the collection itself. Um, that's the 300 and the 856 uh, fields. So this is what um, one of our collections looks like um, in our arch archivist. Um, this is one of our faculty collections, and the professor maintained a faculty homepage. And you'll see that the archive site is grouped with the biographical papers created by the professor. So the top is what archive space looks like, and this is how it's currently displayed in our finding aid. 
And this is our MARC record um, in OCLC. And again, it's, it's a 300 field, um, and it's, as you can see, it's kind of buried in our description, um, so it's not that prominent um, on the page. So um, just like Claudia, um, you know, I, I was new to web archiving when I started at Harvard Business School, so, um, you know, when we started setting up our collections in Archive It, um, I really didn't have a lot of um, knowledge about metadata and how to describe these um, this archived web content. So, uh, really, it, for me, it was to understand which media elements were relevant for the discovery of our archived web content. Um, you know, as I said, we've taken an archival approach, and I wanted to understand the differences um, between an archival approach versus a bibliographic approach. You know, are there advantages of using one? over the other and, and where. Um, and then how do we begin, if we do take a bibliographic approach, how do we begin describing this content more robustly um, using that approach? But as Claudia mentioned as well, I mean, ultimately, we want to increase the discoverability and, accept and usability of our content because we're putting a lot of effort into actually collecting it and we want people to use it and find it. Oops. So our current efforts, uh, efforts um, the first thing we really did before we even uh, started um, looking at how we could enhance our metadata is that we reviewed and revamped our scoping rules for harvesting web content. We, I want to describe this kind of as a pre-step. Um, we felt that it was important because we wanted to truly understand what content we were capturing and why. Um, and this is critical in determining how to optimally describe our content. We then analyzed the 14 recommended elements in WAM um, to see which elements were most relevant and useful for the discovery of our content. Um, and th what this really boils down to us is understanding our users and do we really know who they are. You know, we're still struggling with this um, as we don't have good metrics to measure it. Um, we have a fairly good idea of our internal, who our internal users are, but we really don't have any idea of who our external users are. Um, we then develop standard language for elements that will be likely identical for each collection, and um, we revise the metadata for several collections and archive it. We've read the process and are currently updating all of our collections. So this is um, what one of our records looked like. Um, in archive it pre-WAM. Um, we use nine fairly basic metadata elements. Um, the archive sense is automatically generated by archive it. The description element uh, solely describes content of the website, and we didn't even actually give any indication that this was an archived um, website. The metadata element theme is a custom field we added to our collections into broader themes such as school records, student experience, and social media. And um, pre-WAM, uh, we felt that our strengths in this is that we felt at least our metadata was consistent, meaning we used the same nine metadata elements across all of the collections and archive it. Um, again, the standardized language was pretty consistent. And by adding a theme, we felt our users would be able to find like collections more easily, including our HBS archivists and HBS departments who use these collections most frequently. This is um, an enhanced metadata record in Archive It. Um, the description, we now feel that it makes clear that it is an archive web Con that is archive web content and that users will understand the purpose for collecting the content. And, and again, this goes back to provenance and um, hopefully our users will understand why we are collecting it and, and the purpose for doing that. We added a source element to indicate the source for the title of the collection. Um, we added a date element which now indicates that when the content was first crawled, um, Previously, we had been using um, the coverage element, um, but we decided to maintain the coverage element instead of combining it with the data element. Um, and we just felt that at this time it was important that the information was called out in its own element. Um, we added the URL at the time of capture, 
We added Extend primarily because a collection can, can consist of many archive websites and we wanted to make sure that our users understood this. We added the access statement. Um, for the most part, Baker Library is the collector, but um, we it's, it will probably end up being most standard across collections that we are the collector. Um, as far as rights, we retained the copyright statement, but we also added if there were any restrictions um, to the archive web content. Our theme um, as the element maps to genre form and uh, relation was added. And in, in this case, um, particularly for the HBS website, it is so big that we um, could not have archived the entire site in one crawl. So we crawled it based on um, administrative units, programs, and events. So by adding that relation metadata element, this ensures that our researchers know that this collection is merely a part of a um, bigger website. And the only metadata element missing um, from this particular example is contributor, which we will use when we feel that's applicable. So we have a lot of to-dos. Um, we need to complete our um, Dublin Core collection level metadata. Um, we will continue to explore and have the level metadata where appropriate. Um, and um, we do plan to create a collection level finding aid using the recommended data elements and to create individual collection level catalog records. So we really want to cast a wider net on how we can potentially use, uh, reach our users. Um, we would also like to add a digital collection for archive web content to our, our discovery platform that we have um, at HBS with the goal of repurposing metadata from Archivet. Um, on more on the administrative side of it, um, we plan to update policies and procedures to reflect web archiving metadata efforts. We want to um, try to meet more regularly with public services staff to um, make them aware about our archive web content to ensure that they know how to communicate these resources to our research researchers, but also, you know, as they're interacting with researchers, it would be nice to know how our researchers um, are discovering, if they're discovering this web content. And finally, to develop metrics to track the discoverability and use of archive websites, um, our archive web content. And so finally, just to wrap up, um, some of the challenges that we are facing, that this is a, a big effort, um, and we're hoping it will pay off. Um, metadata currently is created manually and, um, you know, we have quite a few collections that needs to be described, so it's, it's really a big effort, particularly for the person doing the work whose job this is only 25% of his time. Um, so the manual work, because it's part of a person, is pain, painfully obvious and we really need to try to find ways to automate this work. Um, and finally, um, you know, we haven't really coordinated coordinated this effort with other Harvard repositories. Um, you know, we're not really aware of what others are, at Harvard are doing. Have they interpreted the report the same way? Um, or will we have similar metadata to make discoverability across the collection, across the university the same way? So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to um, Rebecca to wrap up. Mm. To wrap up, I know there are a lot of questions. Uh, what, it, what will the influence be of the uh, WAM guidelines and how might they change current practice? Some of this may depend on how uh, far people have gotten in terms of their own uh, guidelines uh, or application profiles for describing web content. Uh, there's a number. Uh, there are a number of cases in the WAM guidelines where the same Dublin Core element is used for information that might be more specifically tagged in other standards. For instance, um, notes, because uh, WAM wanted a lean set of elements, and and note is used, and description Dublin Core description is used for each of these notes that really cover different kinds of notes. Um, there's the question of 
does that make a difference for people who are already describing them or who want to describe them? Do they need to use just note with the initial uh, text uh, de designating what kind of note it is or, um, you know, how does it impact what they're doing now? Also, will it, will it be used to reevaluate people's practices or will the guidelines uh, verify existing ones or, again, what else do we need to um, implement the, these guidelines? Will they mainly be, be used uh, to help institutions who have, haven't uh, been describing web archives? Those are all questions. Uh, one example, as um, was mentioned, I worked on the New York Art Resources Consortium application profile for web ar archives, uh, web archive sites, and we're, we're undergoing a revision. This link is to the current one, but the revision will be out soon where we're adding uh, a mapping to the WAM elements along with the other mappings that are there for uh, Bib frame and mods and schema.org and EAD is being added, et cetera. And what does it mean to comply with the WAM guidelines? Uh, that's, uh, or do we need to? That's another question. Also, what additional guidance is needed? Would it be useful and, and, and additional work? Would it be useful to compile sets of use, a set of use cases for specific environments and workflows, perhaps uh, giving, doing application profiles for those or some other kind of guidance? There are a number of places in WAM where there are a variety of options. They didn't want to... Uh, uh, be too specific and maybe they need fleshing out. Uh, also, the use of control vocabularies. We really don't have good control vocabularies uh, for born digital content. Is there a need to work on something like that? A lot of it will depend on tools and will tools be developed that, that help us in the description and allow us to generate a certain amount of metadata, um, templates for metadata creation, uh, tools for discovering, discovery, and repurposing metadata uh, among different systems and environments, what kinds of transformations might be done. Uh, might we want to expose uh, some of this, uh, our, da our, our metadata for web archives as linked data, for instance, uh, for use in the, per in the future? Um, so I think, uh, Marilee, are you coming on now? Yeah. Or Yes, okay. <laughs> You're the presenter yeah. now. I think uh, we're, we're ready for questions. We have about um, 12 minutes left uh, in the session. Our speakers all did a great job of keeping to time. Um, so we have um, a couple of questions, and also people have been active on chat um, answering uh, one another's questions and exchanging tips and techniques. It's always super great to see that. Uh, Chris Prom had a question uh, which maybe our panelists could address. This is not something I believe that's addressed in the guidelines, but is perhaps um, something that's more of a practitioner um, kind of in practice sort of thing. How would you best describe sites where the URL has changed, but the creator of the site is still the same? So they'd like to provide access to iterations of the site over time based on provenance. Um, and this is really, uh, a question where the tools kind of, um, you know, we have an interplay between uh, descriptive practice and the tools that we use to harvest um, and, and maintain websites. Archive it presumes, uh, Chris says, that the site um, equals the base URL. In a university environment and in other environments, when units move on to a new subdomain or directory, there doesn't seem to be an easy way to access the site variants and provide them a common series level description. Um, Kate Bowers chimed in and said uh, how they can, um, how, how they may be handling this um, at her shop, uh, but Chris was wondering if there was a way to do this right and archive it since they want to do most of the description there. 
So um, Claudia, Mary, Rebecca, any any observations from um, from your end on on how you might um, handle that, or uh, or or places you've seen elsewhere where uh, where, where people are, are grappling with this particular issue? Uh, this is Mary. Um, we definitely have this issue with some of our HBS um, websites. Um, and quite frankly, we haven't figured it out. We, we kind of did a very hacky job of, of addressing this. And what we did is we created a collection of what we're calling sunsetted archive, you know, web content. Um, so we created a collection specifically taking the old um, websites and then we crawl the new websites and then make a connection um, with those two collections through our metadata and we call it a relation and that's how we're solving and it's, it's not an elegant solution or the best solution but for now that's how we've addressed it. I don't know if that answered your question. To me, that's the be that would be the best way to handle it. Um, that you may you make a relationship to um, the new one. I would agree, Chris, with what you just said. <laughs> there, there has to be a better solution um, and for better grouping of the materials. Um, I would agree with that. I'm sorry. I was on. I think I was on mute while I was reading another question. Uh, sorry. Um, so I was reading a question from uh, Jeff Garrett, um, which was asking about. Uh, um, the interplay between um, uh, archived web descriptions and citation management uh, software such as Zotero or EndNote. So does anybody um, have a reference type called archived web content or something similar that can be used with Zotero, EndNote, or something similar? Um, either uh, any of our panelists thinking that far down the road in terms of how um, our descriptions can be um, cited by researchers uh, or or anybody uh, attending attending the the webinar who could pitch that into chat. Um, that may be a little far down the road for us. Um, while people are thinking that I about that, I have a specific question for Mary, which is what level of staffing is it taking to enhance your metadata and archive it? The staffing? Um, well, as, as I mentioned, we have um, a quarter of a person. Um, so the approach that we're taking is that we, we're looking in the long view that um, this person fits in the metadata enhancement when he has the chance to do it. Um, so. Um, you know, we, there's part of me that does it, but um, I think we've been, it, it took a lot more effort, I guess I should step back, it took a lot more effort when we try to get the program up and running, but it's really running pretty smoothly now, so, um, you know, we, it's taking less time to do some of these tasks, so I would just say that you can get away with doing it with a quarter or, or a half a person but it's just going to take a, uh, quite a bit of time just to ramp up and really understand the complexities of um, web archiving and creating the metadata. 
but it, to me it's doable. And can you clarify, is the quarter person, is that an archivist or an archival assistant? It's, it's a processing archivist. So okay. we don't have any um, individuals working, um, we don't have assistants or student working, uh, working on our um, archive, uh, for archiving as, as it stands now. Um, it's really narrow, it's one person's responsibility right now. Okay, great. Um, and another question for Mary. Um, any ideas on uh, use analysis metrics? Um, so how do you locate the use of your content on Open Wayback since the URLs don't indicate collector? So we don't, um, I attempted to use Google Analytics um, through Archive It, but it's terrible. <laughs> so um, I, I kind of gave up on that idea. Um, so one, thing that we're, we're working towards, which I think will actually give us better metrics, is if we can get our archive web content as part of our discovery platform at Harvard Business School, they have built in analytics um, to track who is coming to um, the discovery platform and, um, and how they're, you know, what, what type of search they're doing. Um, I would say that, um, I must confess that our biggest use probably right now is our HBS archivist um, and the administrative departments. Um, so the other thing that we, um, and I don't know if this is going to happen um, with um, our cataloging, but it would be nice to also have that metric built into our, our cataloging. We um, have Hollis Plus at Harvard Business School, or at Harvard University, and I don't know about metrics there, so that's something that we haven't explored. but. I am set on trying to get better metrics because it also justifies all the work that we're doing for collecting all this content. Uh, here is one other question. Um, let's see, can the speakers talk about how their web archived collections have been used by their users thus far? So um, any cases of including those collections in archival instruction. Uh, so kind of some um, hints here from, uh, from, from how these collections might be used. Not hearing anything unless Mary is. Oh, I can, I, uh, well, and uh, Claudia might bring insight. So as I, I mentioned, um, I think for us right now, the, our archive websites are being used primarily by the HBS administrative units um, who, th these are their websites. So they like to look back um, on these websites because they're adding a lot of content to these websites. And so they like to look back at previous versions of it. Um, so that's, to my knowledge, that's all these websites are being used for. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, we are really um, going to try to ramp up our outreach efforts beginning um, in the new fiscal year. Um, and part of that is making our public services staff more aware of the content that we are uh, collecting and how it can be used and then relaying that information to our researchers. So it's very limited right now to my knowledge. Thank you. Claudia, anything on your end? Yeah, I'd just say that um, at USA it's probably pretty similar to what Mary just described. Um, I don't know a lot of in-depth uh, detail about it, but I do know that the selector, for example, who was working with the campaign literature archive, uh, she uses that a lot for her uh, bibliographic instruction, in, um, particularly when she works with uh, public policy and other similar units, but I don't know a lot of detail about how she's using it. Uh, I agree that we need to work with public service people to kind of promote these websites. We're putting in a lot of work to archiving them and we want people to use them. I'll say something in terms of NIARC and um, one of the purposes of uh, uh, archiving uh, what they've archived is uh, because many of the, uh, for art reference purposes and many of these uh, things are no longer like auction catalogs aren't being um, uh, produced in print form anymore. Art galleries 
uh, go, come and go. And um, so it's really for the purpose of reference for the art community. Okay, well, I see that we're at the top of the hour here, and I love that we um, ended this discussion with, uh, with what's the, with, with the end users of, of, of these materials, because of course that's why, that's why we're doing this um, to be careful. So, yes. This is Jackie. If I could just take one, uh, one minute, um, just three informational things. Um, one is that for those of you who have questions that didn't get answered um, to your satisfaction or other questions, um, two possible sources of information that you might want to um, follow up on. One is the Society of American Archivists has a web archiving section with a relatively active listserv, and you need not be an uh, SAA member to, um, to sign on to that listserv. So it's a really great source to ask questions of. And then also, for those of you who are, um, your institutions are in archive it, um, I'm guessing that you all have some kind of a um, partner listserv, and any archive it questions might be well posed there. Finally, um, archive it is hosting a webinar on May 22nd that is pretty much focused on um, WAM's outcomes. You know that Kate Bauer will be speaking, um, Rebecca will be speaking. Um, anyway, so um, that's open to people who are not archive it members as well. So some of those things might be of interest. I'll, I'll enter them into the chat. Uh, well, thanks. I see that people are ebbing away, so we'll be sure, Jackie, that those comments also get summarized in an email that will get sent around with um, with uh, links that were shared during this presentation, um, a links to the uh, the PDF of these slides, and of course a link to the recording. So I want to thank you all. Uh, for your great participation. Thank our speakers, and thanks once again to the OCLC Research Library Partnership for helping to underwrite and inspire the work that you've heard today. Uh, stay tuned for more um, events in this series, and we look forward to the next time we see you. Bye, everybody.